crops. And primarily today we'll talk about two fertility regulating mechanisms, self incompatibility and male sterility. As you know, plants can reproduce sexually or asexually. In sexual reproduction, the flowers bring the gametes together, form zygotes, and so those zygotes have new genetic recombinations. And basically, plants have evolved a variety of adaptations, a flower structure, a timing of flowering, various adaptations that encourage either outbreeding or cross-pollination or inbreeding or self-pollination, and each of those genetic systems has lots of ramifications, not only for how plants evolve through natural selection, but also how plants are, their evolution is guided through plant breeding programs. The two major breeding systems are outbreeding, it's reproduction between different individuals or cross-pollination, and it involves at least two individual plants. Inbreeding, reproduction within an individual, it's self-pollination, and involves a single plant. And of course, during the sexual reproduction, meiosis is where recombination occurs, and fertilization basically brings the, uh, the uh, embryos back to that two-in or diploid state. So recombination is the chief source of heredity variation. Uh, we'll talk... Uh, Variation in numbers of chromosomes or polyploidy is another source of variation that has been used effectively. And mutations have been used, but, but probably contribute far less to the amount of usable genetic variation that breeders use than recombination or, or changes in ploidy levels. If you look at plants, you can often tell whether they're outbreeders or inbreeders. The outbreeders often have lots of flowers, large flowers, bright colors, nectaries, scented flowers, all sorts of things to attract insects or birds or mammals to the flowers to collect the pollen and disperse it among other plants. Inbreeders often have few flowers, very small flowers, same colored, no nectaries, no scents. And the anthers are usually close to the stigmas. In fact, in a lot of inbreeders, the anthers and the stigmas are, are always enclosed in a flower that either opens after pollination occurs or in some cases just doesn't open. So to sort of force an inbreeding. Yeah. What are nectar guides? Uh, nectar guides are just little adaptations on the plant that sort of bring insects into the nectaries. The nectaries produce, uh, uh, are where the pollen is, is, uh, is held, and it's uh, sort of an aromatic materials that guide the insects down to where the pollen is. Advantages of self-pollinations or inbreeding, uh, it preserves well-adapted genotypes. I mean, in an inbreeding plant species, the progeny of a self-pollinated plant are fairly uniform and homozygous and pretty much look like the parent plants. Uh, so it ensures seed set if there are any other pollinators around. And it allows for a single colonizing individual plant. So in order for a plant species to continue to evolve and survive, inbreeding has some advantages, but it has maybe as many or more disadvantages. Uh, it decreases or at best maintains genetic variability. So in a sense, it's an evolutionary dead end. And uh, inbreeders have difficulty adopting or adapting to changing environmental conditions. So again, it's that dilemma of do you need more diversity? Well. Genetic diversity or variation helps you adapt to a lot of different changing environments, whereas genetic uniformity sort of pushes you down a path of either you survive in the environment where you live or else you're really not going to do much changing or adaptation to different environments. And, and ironically, both that uniformity and the diversity have tremendous advantages 
depending on how that plant is to be utilized. So these inbreeders have evolved so that pollination and fertilization often occur in an unopened flower. Plants like wheat, barley, peanuts. Cultivars are very uniform. Seed is produced by selfing and manual crossing is needed to actually bring about any extensive cross-pollination. And so basically you have to go into that closed flower, remove the anthers from the plant that you're going to use as a female, and then bring pollen over from the plant you like to use as a male. Now, in actuality, most of these uniform self-pollinated crops undergo a degree of outcrossing in the field, anywhere from 3 to 5 percent for crops like wheat up to what? 10 or 12 percent for rice and some of the other, other self-pollinated crops. So even though inbreeding is sort of an evolutionary dead end, uh, in nature most of these major crop plants don't always inbreed. There's always a small percentage of outbreeding and that provides a lot of the genetic variation and has been useful in selection and adaptation of adaptation in those crops. A list of crops that normally self-pollinate, barley, beans, chickpea, cowpea, lentils, millet, oats, wheat, triticale, tomatoes and tomatoes you can push it either way, uh, soybean, rice, peanut and peas. So a number of crops that are very important as food for human and animal populations. So the alternate to self-pollination or inbreeding is cross-pollination or outbreeding. This increases genetic variability. It has strong evolutionary potential and it allows adaptation to changing environments. So, you know, if you're a plant species trying to survive outcrossing or cross-pollination seems to be the way to go and in fact there are a lot of mechanisms that have evolved in plants to promote outcrossing. Disadvantages, it can destroy well adapted genotypes. We'll talk about that when we talk about breeding of cross-pollinated crops. Not only can it destroy well adapted genotypes, it will destroy. You can have cr cross-pollinations occur to produce just the ideal heterozygous plant and you'll say well I'd like to maintain that plant but how? If I self-pollinate it I get segregation of all sorts of stuff and I never reproduce that same heterozygous combination. If I cross it with something else and I get a whole bunch of different combinations. So unless I can use vegetative propagation I really have trouble maintaining a well adapted genotype in these cross pollinated and of course it relies on pollination from other plants. So a single plant out in the middle of a desert somewhere, seed happens to germinate, if it's a, out, a cross pollinator it doesn't have much chance of surviving. So pollination and fertilization must occur between different plants to get out crossing. Cultivars are open pollinated so we end up with sort of two types of varieties developed in these cross-pollinated plants. These open pollinated varieties are very diverse. Just combinations that occur naturally by wind-blown pollination in most cases or insect-assisted pollination. Or through intervention of man we've developed a way to sort of capture this heterotic benefits and to produce very uniform hybrids by crossing very specific parents and, and making uniform, you know, sort of controlling the cross pollinations. These are often wind or insect pollinated and in nature either the pollen has to be very light and, and released so that it can float on the wind or else you have to have some sort of floral structure to attract insects in to collect the pollen and take it to other plants. Crops that normally cross-pollinate, alfalfa, cassava, maize, a lot of the forages, pearl millet, rye, safflower, sugar beet, sugar cane, sunflower, a lot of the brassicas, a lot of vegetables. 
uh, sweet potatoes, and a lot of tree and fruit crops. So in nature, you know, uh, during this crop domestication process, humans were able to domesticate some very important plants that are cross-pollinated, but also were able to domesticate and maintain some very important plants that were self-pollinated. And what we'll find out now for the next few weeks, we'll basically concentrate on then how do plant breeders go about Devel sorry, developing new varieties of plants that are either cross-pollinated or self-pollinated. I mentioned uh, some of these plants like uh, tomato can go either self or cross, cotton, oilseed rape, potatoes. If they're isolated, they can behave like self-pollinated plants. Um, and you can isolate them either with bags, tents, greenhouses, or by distance between plants, and they can produce uniform cultivars if well isolated. And in some cases, manual crossing or insect assisted crossing is needed. But the plants themselves will readily accept pollen from either the same individuals and, and self pollen and inbreed, or they will accept pollen from different genetic types and do outbreeding. Yeah. Do you mean in order to make it self-pollinate, you have to do it manually? In this case, to make a cross-pollination, you do it manually. And, and so that's a case of where you basically, by hand, you remove the anthers from the plant you want to use as a female, and you bring pollen in from a plant you want to use as a male. All right, having said all of that, and having pointed out to you that there's some very important self-pollinated or inbred crop plants, in general, plants will try to avoid inbreeding and promote outbreeding. Why would you think they would do that? What advantage would it be to a plant species to promote outbreeding? more adaptability, more genetic variability. And, and we always are faced with this paradox. For a species of plants, it's very desirable to have a lot of genetic diversity and a lot of adaptability. For an individual plant to survive and compete with other plants of the same type, it's better to be uniform and specifically well adapted to the environment where you're growing. And, and so these inbreeders were selected and, and uh, are very, very productive, but today that productivity is certainly helped and maintained by humans selecting for very productive types of pure line varieties that grow very, very well and produce a yield and quality of yield in selective environments. That genetic variation promoted by outbreeding. And so how do they promote outbreeding? We talked uh, Monday about some of the differences in timing of pollen shed versus the, the styles being receptive. And we talked about some of the morphological mechanisms. And, and yeah, th those are there and, and they occur. Um, but there's really not a lot of applications of temporal or morphological mechanisms to promote outbreeding that are useful to, to plant breeders. The two types that plant breeders concentrate on and use extensively are self-incompatibility and male sterility. So why do plant breeders need to do that? Well, genetic variation is created when plants are crossed. I mean, sure. Well, outbreeders cross freely, so shouldn't that help a plant breeder? Well, it, it helps, but it doesn't help all that much because those crosses are uncontrolled. And, and so the plant breeder needs that genetic variation, and a plant breeder needs to promote and create new genetic variation. But in the long run, the plant breeder only wants to look for useful genetic variation. 
And a lot of the variability that, that uh, is maintained and shows up in those outbreeders is not very useful for producing crops that humans can utilize. Inbreeders don't cross freely, if at all, so plant breeders need some sort of controlled mechanisms to create and capture new genetic variation. How do they do that? Well, often in our plant breeding nurseries, we use manual or mechanical control of detasseling. Uh, detasseling in corn is very, very easy. I mean, you just knock the tassel off and you have a female plant. Uh, you can make hand crosses in a number of crops. We showed a few minutes ago, I think that was a wheat or a barley, where you remove the anthers. We can use all sorts of, of tools to do that. Uh, often in self-pollinated crops today, people use just a little vacuum pump and a little glass tube. And they basically just use suction to remove the anthers. Then they bring pollen in from the plants they wish to use as males. Uh, in maize, the crop is so easy to either cross or self-pollinate that we can even do some, some uh, commercial production by detasseling. But also, breeders use uh, this genetic control and self-incompatibility. We'll talk about two major types, gametophytic and sporophytic. And in male sterility, two major types, nuclear, genic, or cytoplasmic. And just to show the detasseling of corn, any way you can cut the tassel off those plants, these become female plants. And as the plant that has the tassel can serve as the male. So it's just a simple matter of planting a female, a row you own as a female, in one row here. A row of plants there you'll use as a male, and a row of plants here you'll use as a female. Just cut the tassels off all of those you want to use as females, and all of the pollen comes from the male. Uh, no, the, 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 there are changes in plant hormone patterns and there, there are certain uh, physiological changes associated, particularly with the tasseling, not so much, but when we talk about cytoplasmic control of male sterility, there are changes. And, and the changes obviously affect flower development and, and gamete development. But there have been no significant effects on physiology, yield, other, other useful traits of the plants. Um, there have been several reports, several publications that claim that cytoplasmic male sterile individuals yield less than the normal counterparts. But there are just as many reports that indicate that they yield more than the normal counterparts. And, and, and so there are lots of changes in the physiology, but from a practical standpoint, none of those changes are significant in terms of manipulating the, the plants to make crosses. I pointed out, uh, even in maize hybrid production now, uh, you know, it used to be employment for high school kids in the U.S. Corn Belt was be a corn detasseler. And they used to have, uh, you know, little wagons on the back of tractors, and the kids would stand on the little wagons, and they would pull them through the field, and they would just pull the tassels out of the plants as they rode through the field and get all the tassels off the female plants. They've sort of evolved now to machines that you adjust the height of the machine to where the tassels are on the female plant, and like wheels that roll, and so the rolling wheels just grab the tassels and pull them out. For... Uh, and when we talk about hybrids and hybrid production, we'll get back to some of the mechanical uh, methods of, of uh, producing crosses. But for the day, the rest of the day, we'll talk about either self-incompatibility or male sterility. So what is self-incompatibility? Well, in a broad sense, it's any factor that will prevent self-fertilization. So it's defined as the inability of a plant producing functional gametes. So it's not sterile. The gametes they produce are functional. But you can't achieve fertilization. 
and we're dealing with genetically based mechanisms, and as I pointed out, that includes some of these morphological, temporal, and, and uh, things such as monoecious and dioecious plants are all included in that. But uh, we'll talk today about mechanisms that are controlled to give different genetics or physiology or biochemistry of the plant. Uh, Self-incompatibility is highly species specific and it's evolutionarily very, very significant. It sort of impedes inbreeding of homozygosity and promotes heterozygosity. Genetic self-incompatibility, as I pointed out, is different from sterility. Both male and female gametes are fertile. Fertilization is blocked. So incompatibility occurs pre-fertilization. It's widespread across lots of different plant genera. It's ancient. This is not something that humans invented or created in order to manipulate these plants. Uh, th this is uh, ancient and ancestral within plant uh, evolution. A and basically what incompatibility means is like by like, you get no fertilization. So if you try to take individuals that genetically are the same, fertilization, they can both produce pollen and eggs, but fertilization won't occur. Like by unlike, you get fertilization. So if you take an individual of one genetic type and with egg cells and pollen from a different genetic type, put the two together, you get fertilization. So basically it's a mechanism that keeps or prevents individuals from self-pollinating. In a normal compatible pollination, the pollen grains adhere to the stigma, they hydrate, they germinate, the pollen tube penetrates down the stigma, grows down the style and fertilizes the ovule. We went through that in, in the last class. In incompatibility, the pollen doesn't fertilize, either because it doesn't germinate or the pollen tube growth down the style is reduced or blocked or the fertilization process itself is blocked. And as people study mechanisms of different types of self-incompatibility, we find primarily we're dealing with reduced pollen tube growth mechanisms come in to sort of stop the pollen on its way down the style. I mentioned there were two types, sporophytic, it's related to proteins or factors coded by S alleles in the sporophytic tissue of the parents. What are the sporophytic tissues? In the alternation of generation, what is the sporophyte? The plant, the big plant structure that you see. So usually then you have interaction between the outer layer of the pollen, the outer layer of a pollen grain, which if you study that little uh, picture on or, or cartoon on uh, pollination and fertilization, uh, the pollen exine is part of the sporophytic genotype and then the female stigma style. So this is an interaction that occurs between the plant producing the pollen and the plant producing the stigma and style. Whereas gametophytic, the factors that control that are coded by alleles present within the gametophytic tissues of the pollen or of the male plant. And it's factors within the pollen itself interacting with sporophytic sporophytic tissues on the female plant. And I'll show you some uh, little cartoons in a minute that will demonstrate that. But uh, sporophytic is less common than gametophytic. The incompatible reaction has occurred by an S locus and it has dominance so that S1 is dominant to S2 and S2 is dominant to S3 and S3 is dominant to S4. It's extremely polymorphic. Incompatibility is controlled by the diploid genotype of the sporophyte 
either the male plant or the female. Thus, pollen will not germinate on a flower that contains either of the two alleles in the parent that produced the pollen. So to show how that uh, functions, all of the pollen grains in sporophytic are produced by a plant, and so you have a two allele system within that uh, diploid plant so that each pollen grain has characteristics of gene S1 and S2, both alleles. So if you try to pollinate a female plant of S1, S2 genotype, no pollination. If you have, uh, again, pollen of the genotype S12, trying to pollinate a female plant with the genotype S1, S3, you still get no pollination because the fact that both of those pollen grains carry the S1 allele as well as the S2 allele allows this S1 allele in the female to reject that pollination. So the only way you can get pollination is if you take that S1, S2 pollen, put it on a plant that has S3, S4 genotype in the style. And then you get pollen tube growth and development. So the sporophytic system, it's kind of easy to remember. It has S1, S2, and therefore it has dominance of relationships. And if you have either of those two alleles present in the pollen, and either one, one or the other present in the style, you get no pollination. This is important in the brassicas. It's inherited as a single locus with multiple alleles. And that locus is actually complex. It's comprised of three genes. And basically, they block pollen hydration and germination. All right, gametic incompatibility is more common. The reaction control by S loci without dominance. Why would that be the case? Because the incompatibility reaction is controlled by the haploid genotype in the pollen. And so if you have a haploid genotype, each pollen grain has only one allele, and, and there's no way to have a dominance relationship. There's only one allele, so you can't have interaction between two alleles of the same locus. So pollen will not grow in any pistil that contains the same allele that the individual pollen grain contains. So in this system, usually all of the pollen will germinate and grow into the style, and usually the growth of incompatible pollen is arrested, and it's based on RNA enzymes that basically seek out and destroy the incompatible pollen tubes. So to show you the little cartoon again, in this case, notice the pollen has either the S1 or the S2 allele. The composition of the sporophyte or the diploid plant is an important. The composition of the individual pollen grain. So S1, S2, the S1 here blocks S1, S2 blocks S2, and you get no pollen germination. If you try to pollinate a plant, the female plant S1, S3, well, the S1 allele here blocks S1, but there's nothing here to block S2, and so you get fertile pollination and fertilization. Do you understand that difference? Why in this system, S1, S3, you get pollination, and in the other system you didn't? And of course, if you had S1, S2, Male with a female S3, S4, completely fertile. None of the pollen is inhibited. Gametophytic is important in the solanaceous crops, tobacco, petunia, tomato. It's inherited as a single locus with multiple alleles. No dominance, right? Because those alleles are expressed 
in haploid or gametophytic tissues, so you really don't have a way to measure whether there's any dominance or not. And molecular studies say there are at least two gene products, but the final result is degradation of RNA in the pollen grains. Uh, gametophytic incompatibility is also important in grasses. It's inherited as two unlinked loci, the S and the Z locus. Both S and Z must match S and Z in the pistol to get incompatibility. And each of those loci seems to be at least two tightly linked genes. And the mechanism on that is still unknown as far as I know. Okay, so you can overcome self-incompatibility. You can subject the plants to higher or lower, lower temperatures and sometimes incompatible pollen will sneak through and fertilize uh, in, uh, the uh, female plant. You can use irradiation and using irradiation at mild levels can allow an incompatible pollen grain to sneak through. You could of course graft. If you take a uh, female plant that's incompatible and graft it onto something that is compatible, you can sort of fool the genetic system. A double pollination, sometimes if you mix compatible pollen with incompatible pollen and you start the process of pollen tubes germinating down the styles, you'll get some incompatible pollen to germinate. And of course, bud pollination and surgical techniques, if you go down and cut off the upper portion of the style, where often an incompatible reaction is expressed, and pollinate down near the micropylar end of, of the style, you can get it. So, so basically, even in these plants that are self-incompatible, you can overcome that self-incompatibility. Not really very important unless you happen to be working in a self-incompatible plant and you need to maintain certain sets of characteristics. So you really need to self a self-incompatible plant. Um, all right, that's basically self-incompatibility. Any questions on that? For the most part, self-incompatibility has been less useful in commercial hybrid or variety production than male sterility. But in some cases, uh, and uh, Dr. Griffiths, when he talks about vegetable breeding, will tell you about some cases where self-incompatibility has been used to commercially produce hybrids. If you can take the female that's self-incompatible, then put plant it with a male, you can ensure that you get hybridization. The only pollinations that are successful are between the male and the, the, the self-incompatible female. In male sterility, there's nuclear, often called genic male sterility. It's controlled by recessive MS genes in the nucleus. That's been very, very difficult to use in, in any commercial hybrid production. Then there's cytoplasmic male sterility, controlled by genes in the cytoplasm, in most cases the mitochondria, and at least one exception, genes in the chloroplast. This has been used extensively in producing hybrids for commercial distribution. The nuclear or genic male sterility, plants that are big MS, big MS, and big MS, little MS are fertile. It's only the total recessive plants, homozygous recessive, little MS, little MS, that are sterile. So the problem you face in trying to use this in any practical application is a pure MSMS -MS population can't be produced. Why? What's the problem with producing a pure recessive, homozygous recessive population? Sterile. They're sterile. They're male sterile. They don't produce any pollen. So how can you self-pollinate? Basically, it doesn't work. You must, to maintain those male sterile MSMS -MS individuals, you must pollinate with a plant that's heterozygous. And when you do that, then 50% of the offspring are sterile, but 50% are also fertile. 50% are 
heterozygous and 50% segregate back out homozygous male sterile. So uh, theoretically, people have tried to use this for seed production. You can take a male sterile line of genotype A, cross it to a maintainer line, the same nuclear type genotype A, but heterozygous for the male sterile gene, and you can maintain your male sterile line in the A background, but again, only 50% of the plants are sterile and 50% fertile. So to, to try to use this to produce a hybrid is, is very, very difficult. At least theoretically, you can take this male sterile recessive line A, cross it with a plant of a different genotype that has the, the dominant MS allele, and you can produce a fertile hybrid. And in fact, people have tried, if I can back up one slide, people have tried various mechanisms. One of the, the most ingenious is people were incorporating a gene for herbicide sensitivity into this heterozygous, it won't, into the plants, and a gene that's closely linked to this dominant MS allele so that you could basically use your herbicide sensitivity to eliminate the 50% of the plants that are fertile and be left with only surviving plants that are male sterile. What problems are they having with that? Well, the basic problem is, I mean, these are two different alleles at the same locus. I mean, how are you going to go about getting a herbicide sensitivity linked only to the dominant form of the allele? But there are lots of ingenious proposals, at least, to do that. But so far, basically, there have been very few hybrids. There have been... Uh, in one of the brassicas, and again, Griff will, will tell you about it, I'm sure, there have been some hybrid production schemes because if, if the value of your seed, if your seed is viable enough that you could manually or some other way go in and eliminate those male fertile plants segregating out of that male sterile population, then if you could go in and cut them out before they flowered, then basically you could utilize this to produce hybrids. Just an example, uh, this is in barley, and I, it's difficult to see, but uh, hopefully on, you can see on, on your slides online, uh, nice plump anthers full of pollen grains versus little dried up shriveled anthers with, with no pollen inside. All right, cytoplasmic male sterility, controlled by mitochondrial, uh, sometimes chloroplast genes, maternally inherited. It is used for hybrid production in many crops, onion, carrot, cabbage, corn, sorghum, pearl millet, sunflower, sugar beets, and I have to add rice to that list now. Uh, it has also been used to produce hybrids in wheat, but the economics of hybrid production just don't, don't make wheat feasible. In fact, the economics of hybrid production in rice don't make it really feasible unless you're in China where, where you, the government's not concerned with the cost of producing the seed. They're concerned with the advantage that the hybrid rice gives for yield. In order to make the system work, you must have nuclear genes that are called restora genes such that if you have a cytoplasmic male sterile or a male sterile cytoplasm and you don't have a dominant nuclear gene for pollen fertility, fertility restoration, you get a sterile plant. But if you have at least one dominant allele that restores fertility, you get fertile plants. And of course, if you have a plant in a normal or non-male sterile cytoplasm, it doesn't matter whether you have any nuclear RF genes or not, they're all fertile. Some examples in maize, here is a gene RF1 that basically gives full restoration of pollen fertility in a cytoplasmic male sterile. This is in the T-type or Texas male sterile. 
Here's the male sterile plant. There are very few anthers exerted, and you can't see them because they're very small shriveled anthers. There's basically no pollen produced. There are other fertility restoration genes that can give partial restoration of fertility and are useful in some cases, but not. Uh, if you wanted to make a hybrid using cytoplasmic male sterility and you found a new line that you wanted to try to use as a female parent, you can very easily convert any line into a CMS background by making a cross. And the key here is the red mitochondria are sterile, the blue mitochondria are normal or fertile. You have two different nuclear types. You make the cross with what you want to use as the maintainer line, the line that the nucleus you'd like to convert over here as the male, and the mitochondria are not passed through the pollen. So basically, you get a plant that is half genotype N1, half genotype N2, but it has only the mitochondria and the chloroplast of the female parent, which is the cytoplasmic male sterile parent. So after six back cross generations, you in essence can convert all of that into nuclear genotype into this background, and bingo, you have a new cytoplasmic male sterile line. How do you make a fertile F1 hybrid? Well, you take that male sterile line, you cross it against a different line that carries, it's either on normal cytoplasm, but it also must carry this RF gene. And you come up with an F1 hybrid that's heterozygous for the RF gene on the sterile cytoplasm, and so you get a fertile F1 hybrid. Yeah. So how do they know if the RF genes are present? Do they use molecular markers between them? How do they know they're the RF genes are present when they select all the lines? That they are not I didn't would they How do they know that the RF is present or not present when they select Oh are not present. Well they the 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 basically if you find a new line the first thing you do with it, if you want to use it for hybrid production, is you cross it on a male sterile cytoplasm. And if the F1 progeny is sterile, then that new line does not have RF genes. If that F1 progeny is fertile, then that new line has RF genes. And, and so in your breeding program, you take all of your new lines and cross them on a sterile cytoplasm, and you sort them into two groups. Those that are sterile are potential female parents those that restore are potential male parents. And then you maintain all of those lines that restore that cytoplasm by selfing to maintain that they are a homozygous RFRF, big RF, big RF. Um, and it's a little more, in maize it's more complex than that. There are at least three different types of male sterile cytoplasms. And two of those types have been used extensively. So, so really, you cross your lines on the two, at least two different male sterile cytoplasms. For crops like sorghum and rice, even though there are more than one male sterile cytoplasm available in sorghum, only one has been used for commercial hybrids. Yeah. Yeah, N is just the uh, nuclear. This is the, the same genotype, N1 and N1. So that in this case, what you do is you have a male sterile version of CMS line A. It's got no RF genes. It's in a uh, red mitochondrial or male sterile cytoplasm. And it's got nuclear uh, genotype N1. You have another line that is the same nuclear genotype. It has no RF genes. But its difference is it's in a fertile cytoplasm, so a normal or non-sterile cytoplasm, so that even though this has no RF genes, it's still fertile. And so you can just maintain that inbred. It's, it's almost like a self. You have N1 genotype by N1 genotype. Just one's in a fertile cytoplasm, the other's in a sterile cytoplasm. And that's how you maintain 
that male sterile cytoplasm to use in hybrid production. Whereas down here, you take that N1 genotype and cross it by N2 genotype. And if that N2 genotype has the RF genes, then you get a fertile hybrid. It's in the sterile cytoplasm, but it's been restored to fertility. Yeah. That's the type of chloroplast. The, uh, th this is basically the same line. The nuclei are the same. The chloroplasts are the same. The only difference is this one has male sterile mitochondria. This one has fertile mitochondria. Down here, you have a line that has different type of mitochondria. They're fertile, and you have even different type of chloroplast. And for most cases of cytoplasmic male sterility, the chloroplasts aren't very important. The key is in all of these cases, you can make all of this maintenance, do all of these conversions, because these organelles do not pass through pollen. The pollen grain, when it germinates, and the pollen nuclei move down that pollen tube, basically it's just the pollen nuclei that go into the micropile and fertilize the egg cells and the polar nuclei. So we can separate out and leave all of the cytoplasmic DNA from that male side. It's just left. It never gets into the female cytoplasm. All right, I think I've just got a picture of this. This is CMS production in onion. It's a little difficult to see, but you can sort of see two different types. One of these types would be male fertile. And the reason this is a little lighter is because all of those anthers are out and, and it's shedding. The other type would be male sterile. So you plant these rows in a field and all of the seed produced on these male sterile rows must be pollinated by pollen from the male fertile rows. And these are two different genotypes. So this is an F1 hybrid. So you basically plant, you go in usually early on and eliminate these male rows so you don't have any uh, fruit produced on those rows harvested and you'll harvest only the uh, male sterile rows. All right, that's it on male sterility and self incompatibility. And we'll talk about these again several times in the course as we talk about uh, methods that breeders use to manipulate uh, their crops.